So our next speaker is Agnes Tawari from Hong Kong, China, who I think wins the distance prize. <laughs> and she's going to talk to us about risk factors. Well, thank you very much for giving me the, uh, the chance to actually share with you uh, our latest information on, on risk factors in terms of elder abuse. And it is really, it's very new. Uh, we actually finished um, analyzing it again last week. Um, well, you're probably quite familiar with uh, the Victoria Harbor in Hong Kong. And sometimes when you look at that, you forget that actually behind the scene, that Hong Kong, just like any big city, you know, we do have our problems. And uh, of course, as you know, Hong Kong actually went back to China in 1997. And, um, but still, Hong Kong still very much maintained the gateway between the East and the West. And in some ways, uh, we can influence China a little bit, especially in the prevention of violence, which is you know, reassuring to hear. This is where I work on a good day. There are not many of these good days because uh, our air quality is going down. Um, Show you a bit about, this is um, my parents' 60th wedding anniversary last year. And what I'm trying to show you is that, um, you know, still in the Hong Kong Chinese community, um, our parents are still very much the center of the household, and I'm sure you can read Chinese. And what it says is, <laughs> the law family, which is my, uh, my, you know, my maiden name, uh, we welcome you and we'd like to entertain you and join us in this celebration of our parents' 60th anniversary. And, and we really had a wonderful time. And, you know, sometimes we forget. Uh, we think that, you know, our older people in the community are always happy like this, when, in fact, this is not the case. When it's something like that, then, you know, many people don't know how to deal with it. And in fact, when I talk about elder abuse, some people actually you know, don't really want to continue with the conversation. Um, perhaps thinking that if we don't talk about it, then it's not going to get any worse. But of course, you and I know that's not the case. Fortunately, we do have researchers in China, in Hong Kong, and I'm sure you know about this Tim Dong. They actually have persevered for well over 10 years in China. And they actually look at the risk factors um, in Hong Kong, my colleague Elsie Yan uh, and Catherine Tang is actually was her uh, PhD supervisor. They've done some fantastic work and research in terms of looking at elder abuse in Hong Kong among the Hong Kong Chinese. Um, these findings are actually very useful. Now, for me, where do I come in? Well, I mainly work with families in a community, and uh, families actually have got various problems. I mainly work with women, mainly work with their children. Um, but also from time to time, some of these women are older women. And what I'm hearing from these women actually are things that I wasn't familiar with. And, uh, and that started, I started raising this question about five, six years ago. And then I realized that intimate partner relationship is not like this. Pair of Mandarin ducks. This is symbolic of what Chinese marital relationship is like. And for some people, they still believe in that. In fact, we use this to greet our uh, newlyweds. They are like Mandarin ducks. But for some of us, we realize the Mandarin ducks sometimes don't see eye to eye. And this is what I see in the community and also in the shelter. And of course, you and I know intimate partner violence, really, it doesn't respect any culture or age. And Chinese people, Chinese culture is not a protective factor. And, and some of us have been trying to drive this message home about this. And the questions that actually started you know, raising in my own mind about, as I said, four, five, six years ago is, I am seeing intimate partner violence victimization in our older Chinese women. 
And and I've been wondering, is this a, a continuation of what's been happening for a long time? Only now that uh, I have the opportunity of actually talking with them, or is this is something new. Something happened after you know they reach a certain age. And also, does the violence increase, the decrease, or remain the same over time? And also, what is the effect on the survivor's health? And and how does she respond to it? So um, last year, I started actually uh, just a small scale qualitative study because I started by looking by wanting to look at what's going on here among these uh, older abused Chinese women. And I was fortunate to actually uh, sample across all 18 districts in Hong Kong. Uh, the reason being that at the same time I was conducting and still conducting a, um, a, a quantitative study that uh, because I have to uh, talk to 600 abused women in our community and also in our shelter. And uh, in addition, I have to do 200 in-depth individual interviews. And the funder gave me one year to do this. Um, I'm managing slowly, and I think I'll probably just meet the target. There's one thing you're not short of in Hong Kong, it's people. <laughs> and I do have a lot of women who really want to, they know that's the challenge for me, and they really want to help me. And I think this is really good. You know, sometimes it's knowing that I don't just work with them, but they also work with me. And um, so they made Chinese women age 60 or above. Why 60? Well, because there's a compulsory retirement age in Hong Kong at 60. I would have been forced into retirement later this year because I reached 60 uh, this October. Fortunately, my university has the insight that life actually starts at 60. <laughs> And they actually asked me to stay on for another six years. So I intend to carry on and show to people that life really starts at 60. But, you know, that's the reason why I actually have to start looking at, you know, from age 60 and above. And, of course, you know, they're screen positive for IPV victimization using the Chinese uh, abuse assessment screen. And as you see, I started last September and just finished interviewing uh, the 14 women uh, in May. Now, I don't have time to go into detail of this, but I'm very happy to answer questions, or indeed you can actually email me. It took me three years to find out how to elicit information, sensitive information such as sexual abuse, such as partner violence from our Chinese women, especially an older Chinese woman. It can be done, but it will take time. It was a steep learning curve for me. Um, I did all the interviews myself because I need to learn through this. And uh, it wasn't always easy. I was scared to begin with. I was scared. But now I feel very comfortable with it. And I also feel relieved that through the interviews, the woman actually gets help. They're able to come to terms and face the problem, and they no longer blame themselves for what happened. And I think this is very powerful interviewing indeed. And as you can see, it takes time to warm them up. So warming up is important. Ask them to explore the context is important. Uh, yes, can they actually recount how many times they have been psychologically abused? If I ask them how many times, no, they can't tell me. But if I give them a time, give them a chance to actually talk about their life history, to validate their feelings, validate their experience, and explore further, and validating each time, but each time going more in depth, then it can be done. And what I find that it is important before I leave the woman that um, we actually, or I actually, acknowledge what they've gone through, affirm the resilience, affirm what they've achieved, and, uh, and also acknowledge how difficult it must have been for them, and it will continue to be difficult for them. But they can be facilitated to empower themselves. Now, empowerment, we don't have a word in Chinese. So I never even try to tell the woman I empower them. I don't know how to empower them, and I cannot empower somebody, but I facilitate their empowerment. And that actually took me a whole month to get that sentence translated into the Chinese that makes sense to them. 
that I can speak with confidence in Chinese, and that's important. So, obviously, we translated, uh, transcribed, and translated. Uh, uh, well, I didn't translate. We just transcribed into Chinese, and uh, because it is important, and as we listen. Uh, as we are trying to analyze, we also listen to the digital recording, because words are really powerful. Once the words get tra transcribed onto papers, we lost a lot. And uh, we have three researchers, and independently they analyze this. And I bring them together, and we hold weekly discussion meetings. And each of these meetings probably lasts for three or four hours, and then I will just cut off the meeting because they get tired and they don't hear anymore. But it is important that we get to consensus. So what have we found? That uh, we were lucky to actually um, have interviewed with 14 Chinese women. As you can see, the average age, uh, the average age is 67, and they range from 60 to 80. One thing we did not expect, 11 of them were immigrants from China. Now, be very careful when we use this word immigrant. Hong Kong is actually full of immigrants. My mother was an immigrant from China in 1950. So we have different waves of immigrants. So when we talk about immigrants in Hong Kong, we need to understand. Sometimes Hong Kong people welcome the immigrants. Sometimes we actually have sympathy for them, and really it is very condescending, but, you know, it is sympathy. Sometimes we don't like them, like now, because we have immigrants coming to Hong Kong every day. It's a fixed quota, 150 every day. Unfortunately, we are ill-equipped to receive these people. And this is why I work with a lot of, we don't call them immigrants anymore. I've been told the latest term is new arrivals. <laughs> so I asked my, our official, so what is the time for this new arrival? He said, don't really know, actually. And, and he's really honest. And he said, you know, you can say up to seven years, because by the time they reach seven years, they can get their um, permanent citizenship. So you get... We all have an ID in Hong Kong. You get your three stars on it, so you're one of us. You know, it is really sad when you're something like this. And how many years living in Hong Kong? Look at this. Five years, five years, this is the current wave of immigrants, okay? Fifty years, somebody like my mother or even older, you know, so, but the average age is 30 years. I purposely bring in the years in Hong Kong because you're going to see in a minute. How long have they been married to their partner? Five to 54 years. Again, these five years, less than 10 years, this is the current wave of immigrants, and they do have problems of their own. Um, you know, some of these are quite unique compared with, say, the problems my mother faced when she was a new immigrant to Hong Kong. Education, really a wide range, even among the 14. Five of them in university that have received university education. Ah, you might think these are the younger ones just come to Hong Kong recently. No. These were the ones that came to Hong Kong around about my mother's time. This is after the Second World War. They came to Hong Kong and also they came to Hong Kong after the communists took over China. And financial hardship expressed by ten of them. You know, this is including the people who've been in Hong Kong for a long time. So what about the history of partner, uh, uh, intimate partner violence? Well, it ranged from 1 to 41 years. Obviously, the ones are the ones that come to Hong Kong in the current wave. And eight of them said they were afraid of their abusive partners. And regardless whether they are afraid or not, then they mention things like choking, suffocation, beating up, and threatened with knife. We don't usually have guns in Hong Kong, but knife is just as lethal because every household has got at least one. And it's very difficult to say, you know, get rid of the knife because they need that to cook. Uh, frequent pushing and shoving. Now, you may say, well, you know, how bad is it? Well, Hong Kong, we are very limited by space. So if somebody pushed me, and especially a man pushed me, that I will push, I can hit the wall, I can hit an, a sharp object, and I can get very hurt. So being pushed and shoved in Hong Kong actually, you know, is something very serious. Ten reported IPV-related <coughs> injury. The violence, seven said it was escalating. This is compared to in the matter of last year. 
Six of them remained the same and one set decreasing. When we actually went into it a bit in more detail, there was an unexpected finding. Eight of the women reported their partner used non-violent controlling behaviors, something like you see here. Now, we only discovered this because we encouraged this woman to talk. And we said, apart from the physical force, apart from physical violence, what else did your partner do to you that was non-violent but made you uncomfortable? We didn't, I didn't use the word controlling. I used the word uncomfortable in Chinese to bring out. Had I used controlling, I don't think they have said as much because controlling translated into Chinese means something else. Same as abuse. I don't use the word abuse in Chinese. So some of the examples you can see here, economic control. Well, he only gives me $50 a day to buy the food for the family as well as cigarette and beer. I don't know how this woman managed. She managed for well over five, six years because $50 in Hong <laughs> Kong dollars per you can buy you a pack of cigarettes. And use of threats, you know, the sort of thing that I hear, not only for the woman of this age group, but also younger ones will kill her and also kill himself. This one was really a very sad case. And in fact, I have to debrief myself when I finished the interview. It hit me that hard. This woman was constantly being intimidated that this is a partner of over 70 years old. Uh, he has uh, a mistress that he would bring home and have sex in front of her as a way of punishing her. This woman felt so ashamed. She wasn't angry with him. She felt ashamed of herself. And apparently, I was the first one she ever told about this. Because sexual issue is such a taboo in the Chinese society that it took me a while to talk to them about this. The problem was with me. As a researcher, as a nurse, I couldn't even talk to this woman about it. But now I'm getting better. Because the woman actually helping me come to come to terms with this. Because they're actually saying to me, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Attention please, attention please, the fire alarm is about to be tested, the fire alarm is about to be tested, please contact building administration if you have any difficulty hearing the alarm. <laughs> I can hear, shall I carry on until, until the fire alarm goes? Yeah. So you can see the emotional abuse that is constantly, you're talking about years in, years out. Attention please, attention please. All floors hearing continuous bells, please evacuate immediately. All floors hearing continuous bells, please evacuate immediately. All floors hearing intermittent bells, please stand by. <laughs> Thank okay. you. So this is again years in years out being told how useless that she is. I probably know a bit how the woman feels. <laughs> the fire alarm test is now complete. <laughs> this is original. Thank you. This is original for me. <laughs> Isolation. Well, it's not easy to be, uh, it's not difficult to be isolated in Hong Kong anyway because of the structural uh, setup. That, um, you know, I don't know who my neighbors are um, unless I go on my way to actually say hello to my neighbors. But this is a woman and she's not alone, uh, that she was not allowed even to say hello to the neighbors. And, um, and also telling the children what a bad mother that she was, you know, use the children. Remember, some of these children are actually grown up. But as the children were growing up constantly, that uh, they were drummed with this message. And minimizing was another example uh, of the control that, um, you know, that telling her that she deserved to be punished because she was doing something wrong. So these examples kept on coming up in the, in the women's um, accounts. Then there was something that hit us. We saw things that didn't quite fit in. We couldn't say, well, you know, this is the pattern. So having actually worked with the, uh, the, uh, the, what the findings for well over two or three months, I think two months minimum, probably as long as three, 
we're beginning to see this pattern emerging. What we can see that actually it looks like there are two groups of women here. There is one group that the partners actually use controlling behaviors, and there were eight of these women. Six of the women that we did not hear, there was report of the partner using controlling behaviors. And in order to affirm this, we actually went back to the digital recordings again and again and again to make sure that was the case, and that was confirmed. Now, having separated women into two groups, what we found was severe depressive symptoms and PTSD symptoms. They're reported by seven in the group that actually talk about the use of controlling behavior. The group that did not report this, that the, these symptoms, only two of them reported this. So we saw actually there were differences. And then when we look at that same thing applied to being afraid of the abuser, um, that the violence was escalating. What we found is that um, there are certainly the differences in the two groups, you know, with more women in the group reporting the use of controlling behavior, reporting more of this. Now then for the item four, five, and six, we are still no clearer. We are still trying to work with this. It looks like the, the history of um, uh, intimate partner violence that for the group, the reported use of controlling behavior, it seems to be longer because the average age was 19. Now, for the group that said no report of controlling behavior, then it's a huge variation. Mainly, they're shorter, you know, about one, three, five years. But then we had two women actually reported 40 years. So we still can't work out what's going on here. In terms of intimate partner violence-related uh, uh, injury, six for one group, four for the other. So the, whether the controlling behavior was used by the partner or not, that the injury appeared to be the same. Well, I think that goes to show one thing, that if you're a woman, you're abused by your partner, you can get hurt, whether controlling behavior was used or not. Again, same thing applied to using suffocating behavior um, uh, and so on. Doesn't seem to be a lot of difference. So we are still grappling with the injury, the violence, and also with the kind of um, uh, 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 violence. But we believe we need to work on this more because certainly it has implications for research and for practice. I think we need to look into more abuse by an intimate partner in an older woman. We need to look at the trajectory. We need to look at the effect on the woman's health. We need to look at her response to, I, the, the, to intimate partner violence. We also believe that for our health professional, for our social services professional, for our police, that we actually need to include the assessment of controlling behaviors when screening older Chinese women for elder abuse in research and also in clinical practice. Thank you. Now, this is the word. You probably saw this in the, uh, Chinese, in the Olympic in Beijing. This is the word I adopt because that's the word that says harmony. And in fact, that is the ultimate goal that we're trying to achieve harmony in our society. Thank you.
Um, we had expected that both Mala Shankardas and Abla would be here with us, and uh, neither of them were able at the last minute to come, and we thought we would be able to connect by video, but that appears not to be the case. So, uh, we do have Marie and Ariella here who can give you a very fast five-minute report, um, and we have a very brief video clip from Luz in Peru. Um, so could we have Marie first? Okay, so these are the uh, highlights from the last year. So. Uh, as you can imagine, I really had to make a selection because many things have been going on. So uh, the Canadian representative for ENPEI is Charmin Spencer. So she's been helping me. I just want to remind you that Canada is a large country, 10 provinces and three territories. Regarding criminal law, we share the same law. It's pan-Canadian. But for other issues, especially related to health and social work, it's each province that has their own laws and policies. So there's a lot to say just on that. There was a federal initiative on elder abuse for the past three years. It's just ended in March 2011. And you know, a lot of times changes are tied up with some money. So a few people are now worried because there's been many, many projects, but what will continue, we don't really know. And out of these projects, I selected a few just to give you an example in some provinces, like in Alberta, they have provided a guide to support uh, supported decision making and also so they did some changes to the Protection for Persons in Care Act. So it was proclaimed on July 1st, 2010, and the new legislation replaces the former act of the same name and improves protection for adults from abuse while they are receiving care of support or support services funded by the government. In New Brunswick, two examples too. The Abuse Prevention Program for Residential Facilities has been launched, and also they now have developed a specialized forensic interview training for investigators in the field of elder abuse. In Ontario, they receive money for many projects. I just selected one, which is Age Strong Intergenerational Project, respecting seniors in, is respecting yourself. So this was developed with actually some NGOs, and it's mainly in the Guelph and Wellington County in Ontario. British Columbia also has been developing important tools, and actually Lynn McDonald showed you one of the tools that is being less intrusive. That's the tool working with Aboriginals. So all these projects were funded by the federal government. Now we have something new that is coming on right now. The federal government, we have a conservative government, took the first step to criminalize elder abuse. And what has been announced now is that vulnerability will now be a factor to consider in sentencing. So we're seeing here some tendencies and there will be some debates around that because it's not, it's not for everybody that this is the good way to take, but actually this is where we seem to be going right now. And like I was telling you earlier, regarding Quebec, we also have that plan of action that has been launched last year that was not funded by the federal government. Um, I already gave you all this information. Maybe the last one I didn't tell you. I told you about the four structured uh, new uh, action, and the research chair is one of the four actions, but also there's some improvement to actual practices, and there's more than 30 other actions, and in each action, there's a government agency or a ministry that is rep responsible for implementation, and actually we will do the follow-up, and we will actually monitor the changes. Uh, regarding publications, I really had to make a selection. I really want to raise two publications. One that was just raised this week, it's from the Canadian Centre for Elder Law. It's called Moving from Scrutiny to Strategy, an Analysis of Key Canadian Elder Abuse and Neglect Cases. And it's published in both in French and English, and you have there the link for their address if you want to actually download the report. 
And also Anne Soden, which is a lawyer in Montreal, she is finishing the second edition of her book called Advising the Older Client. Actually, she's the editor and she's having several partners all around Canada. And there are some important issues regarding new ways of working in elder abuse field. Now for the States, my uh, partner here is Jordan Cosberg, actually is the American representative for ENPEA. And Jordan is quite new in the position, so he actually stressed one point that he really wanted me to share with you, is the passing of the Elder Justice Act. It had been pushed by academics and service providers for many years. It will create mechanism to combat elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation in the community and within long-term care facilities. The Elder Justice Act that was passed was only one half of the original bill, which included criminal justice provision too. Actually, the uh, actual funding for the Elder Justice Act has not come through yet. So I was talking earlier with our colleague, Pat Brunel, and actually she was telling me that we're kind of fragmented and we're kind of waiting to see what actually would come out of this act. And uh, the other thing Jordan wanted me to raise to you is actually the importance of awareness. And uh, there's uh, Mickey Roney, who was an entertainer, went and did a testimony to the U.S. Senate Special Committee on Aging because he was mistreated by the ends of a stepson. And actually, when you have public persons like that that do a public talk, it really raises a lot of awareness. So that's it for the highlights of North America. <laughs> oh, I forgot. Sorry, sorry. Next rendezvous, because there's things that we're doing again. We're going to be in Ottawa in October. We did propose a symposium on elder abuse in North and South America, because this is the Pan Am Conference. And also, we plan to be in Dijon next January, because there's the Madrid Plus 10 Conference there. And I already proposed a symposium regarding policies and practices in countries speaking French, so Francophone countries. But I would really Really like, and we still have time to have another symposium on international perspectives. <laughs> so now I'm through. <laughs> so Ariella. Hi, I don't have a PowerPoint. You heard already a lot on some of the recent studies that has been uh, done in Europe and what has been. Uh, going on in Ireland regarding elder abuse and it does go on in many countries around Europe not only having conferences or a day but different kind of activities that I wouldn't elaborate. I want just to uh, talk about few examples that people wrote me. For example I have one from Serbia from the Red Cross of Serbia so in addition to organizing a two-day conference related to issue about age discrimination. They are also conducting a survey on this uh, topic and uh, some part of the survey refer to safety in elderly homes as well as chronically pain and discrimination when it comes to prescribing or giving painkillers, which is one form uh, of abuse. Uh, they also developing a training program to empower and to show initiative for uh, decision making uh, among the elderly. So those are some highlights from Serbia. Then if we talk about the Netherlands, they have a project with the Support Center of Family Violence to screen older people in acute and institutional care settings and arrange a step plan uh, for help. They are also doing a qualitative research project and as they are finalizing preparations for a symposium entitled Elder Abuse in Context. Okay. Uh, there are many developments in Spain. They have a working group on materials related to elder abuse and other uh, security uh, problem. They have a master plan which is called Plan Mayores, Plan for the Elderly which covers main uh, lines of action carried out by the Ministry of Home Affairs in preparing material to prevent abuse and violence against older people. 
There is the recent study on the prevalence of elder abuse in the Basque country, uh, looking uh, or interviewing uh, 1,200 people, 60 and over uh, in the community. Then they also mentioned the European project that I think was also uh, presented a little bit in Bologna, which is called Milthea. This is a project where you have uh, the collaboration of Germany, Austria, Spain, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. And uh, they want to develop a monitoring system that allows the assessment of elder abuse in long-term care as a precondition for prevention. I think this is very important because we know there aren't this much done on elder abuse uh, in an institutional setting. And they want to develop the best practice scenario to assess elder abuse to every tool uh, in the European region as well. And the last thing I want to, uh, to report is developments in my country, in Israel, where a lot has been done on uh, elder abuse. And uh, after we made a prevalence study quite a few years back, then uh, the government decided to establish uh, in each uh, local welfare office a special unit on elder abuse manned by a professional social worker with training both in aging and in elder abuse. And uh, this uh, heads of unit are having a one-year course on elder abuse, including uh, exposure to the legislation. We have in Israel mandatory reporting. Unfortunately, this does not include financial abuse. So now we are working with the Ministry of Justice to include also a financial abuse within this mandatory reporting system. And there is a constant evaluation of the work of these uh, special units, which really raised the identification of elder abuse and developing different intervention uh, programs for elder abuse around the country. There is also an interministerial forum which meets once a month of the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Welfare, the National Insurance Institute, and the NGOs responsible. I'm also part of this forum. Uh, there are special protocols now, both from the Ministry of Health and from the Ministry of Welfare, <coughs> that people have to report uh, immediately when a suspicion of abuse comes to their knowledge. And in our mandatory reporting, not only professionals have to report, but anyone who witness a neighbor or whoever who witness abuse must report. And actually, if I'm a neighbor and I didn't report, I can go to jail for three months. Of course, nobody uh, was sent to jail, but uh, this shows you the importance of really detecting and doing something uh, about this. I think there is still uh, a lot of uh, work to be done, but uh, looking at what has been accomplished in the years that I've been involved in the field, I think we should be proud on all the accomplishment, and we should thank, you know, I think uh, most people in INPEA have been working on this voluntarily and really pushing it, and I want to thank you all, and I think we had a wonderful conference. Thank you. I'd now like to ask our colleagues from Prague to come and tell us about what they have for us um, next year. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, International Federation on Aging and uh, Czech Civic Organization 
život 90 means life 90. I'm proud to invite you to 11th IFA Global Conference on Aging, which uh, will be held in Prague next year from 28th of May to 1st of June. Aging Connects is the title of this conference. Aging Connects because of bridging disciplines, bridging seniors and their representatives, politicians and academics, businessmen, experts, researchers, etc., etc. And uh, Aging Connect is conference which will be in year of the 10th anniversary of Madrid International Plan in European Year of Active Aging and Solidarity Among Generations. WHO focus on health and aging, etc. And what we will deal with the conference. The main topics all the persons and development advancing <coughs> health and well being into old age, ensuring enabling and supportive environments. Connected technologies. Detailed, it means three sub teams in each the main topics. First, second one, third one, there is neglect, abuse, and violence, two, and last one, group of sub teams. I would like to please my colleagues, Daniela Redkova, to follow the explanation, please. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, I learned a lot. And as you can see, the conference has a pre-conference event. And uh, it's a day before the conference starts. And uh, you can see the celebration of the World Elder Abuse Awareness Day becoming part of the conference. I think uh, your organization actually is joining the conference and I think it's a tremendous opportunity uh, to bring you together with this global conference. The first one in the pre-conference events is already a tradition for IFA conferences. It's uh, a senior officials meeting, which is becoming a platform for the governmental officials, senior officials, and the ministries to come. We are expecting about 80 of them to come and concentrate on long-term care. Uh, as the first picture showed you, um, and I hope many of you know that Prague is really a historic city, uh, we would like to have the conference very exceptional and reaching out not only in the conference center but also in the city. So we asked one of our sponsors uh, to allow us to hold this official officials meeting in uh, the Prague crossroads. So uh, I will get back to it. Uh, just let me go through um, uh, the other ones which were uh, which were there, uh, which in the pre-conference, uh, they also will be your conference, and uh, they will be master classes. And there is another one short note master classes. Uh, three of them will be done in conjunction with the in cooperation with the Charles University, uh, which is a great uh, honor for us as well. Uh, some of the faces here must be familiar, or I hope they are to you. Uh, and the top row in the center is one of our sponsors, and I think one of the most prominent senior we have in our country. It sounds horrible, <laughs> but yeah, President Havel is a senior, and, and he will be actually celebrating 75th birthday this year. 
and uh, he is the one who uh, offered that we could use the Prague crossroads uh, for the senior officials meeting. Uh, next to him, to the left, is Martina Navratilova, the first lady he invited actually in 1990 to come back. And it's hard to believe that she is a voice of AARP in America. But she's Czech and, uh, and very proud to defend the interests of AARP. Uh, looking at these two, we got the idea to open the, the conference with um, the extraordinary voices or voices of extraordinary people from the Czech Republic. And since this is a global conference, we are reaching out um, for people like Václav Havel, Martina Navrátilová, Miloš Forman, uh, Dana Zátopková, uh, people who lived sometimes even abroad, but definitely uh, succeeded on the global level and are famous. Uh, we heard a lot of uh, people speaking here from Canada. So one of the persons we are inviting to take part in these voices is Mrs. Bata, Beta Shoe Factory. Uh, she lives in Toronto, but she continues coming to our country because Beta Shoes Factory is very fun in our country. And she is an exceptional lady, also in her 80s, and still very active. So we felt that these people should be heard and show how active aging really has an international year that year we have the conference. So it's just to give you an overview. Uh, and uh, if some of you probably received our first newsletter and there was an article about our keynote spe speaker from South Africa, Joe de Colopin, who is on the picture on the left. And on the right, when I talked about uh, the master classes, uh, two of them will be um, directed by professors, an exceptional, I would say, uh, age, aging um, topics uh, taught at Charles University. One of them is uh, Dr. Kalvach, and I hope you could meet him. Um, so there are special events besides the opening, which I talked already about. There is also a gala evening held in the National Theater in Prague, um, we combine ballet and folklore performance, and there will be a special route afterwards on the roof of uh, the theater. Uh, this is just to let you know what the package includes, but talking about the package, we not only brought this very boldly put it on the table that everybody can see our poster, uh, but we brought some materials, and I wanted not only to invite you, but I would love to ask your help, we both would like to, if you could spread the word about the conference. And I know we always ask, please, can you email or can you pass it to your members? Um, I was lately conducting a different survey, I'm a psychologist by background, and nothing to do with this conference, but we were researching how you spread the information. And we found out that if you yourself would be so kind, and even it goes to your members, would just use a short email, you know, you should look at this new newsletter, or don't forget next year we could meet in Prague, and email to your friends. There is a guarantee they will open your email. They might skip our newsletter. Mm -hmm. uh, so before we close, and thank you for attention, uh, the second newsletter will be going out this coming week. Have, would have more information about the speakers. Uh, <coughs> the registration is already open. Uh, we already got a very positive incentive from the Czech Airlines that they are giving us discounts. We are meeting tomorrow with Ms. Gloria Gutman and we are going to discuss what will be the program for INPES meeting in Prague. I think you already brought up so many interesting topics which should be heard. And uh, giving you this exposure, I think it will help both the conference as well as INPA. And thank you very much. <laughs>